Welcome to the annual Domestic Violence Awareness Month kickoff. The Department on the Status of Women and the Domestic Violence Consortium holds this event each year to mark the beginning of Domestic Violence Awareness Month. First off, I wanna give a huge shout out to Domestic Violence Consortium's fearless leader and co-sponsor of today's event, Beverly Upton. Where's Beverly? <laughs> Domestic violence is an issue that spans many departments and agencies here in San Francisco. As a city, we have worked very hard to develop strong partnerships. Uh, I wanna welcome to our event, uh, Supervisor Catherine Stephanie, yeah. Supervisor Asha Safai. Oh, yeah. Asha Safai, Supervisor Safai, give us a wave, all right. Uh, City College trustee Ivy Lee has joined us. Uh, Fire Chief Janine Nicholson, we welcome her. SFPD Commander David Lazar. Uh, representing uh, San Francisco Airport, Francesca Garcia Godos. And on her way is a SHARP Director Kelly Lou Densmore. She is the new Director of the Office of Sexual Harassment and Assault Response and Prevention. So, tonight's theme is Building Pathways to Safety. We recognize that domestic violence is an issue that impacts every uh, gender, race, sexual orientation, immigration status, and we need to meet our diverse community members where they are. We're so proud of our partner agencies that work so hard every day to expand women's safety. If you are from one of our partner agencies, make some noise. Please stay until the end of the event as the sun sets, City Hall will be lit purple for Domestic Violence Awareness Month. This is the only time of the month it will glow purple. It's truly magnificent, a wonderful uh, selfie shot. So uh, I want to welcome, let's see, we are, uh, we are um, welcoming, oh, welcoming our, um, President uh, Zawart, uh, commission on, from the Commission on the Status of Women, the strongest women's commission in the country. Let's give that a cheer. <laughs> President Zawart is a lifelong advocate for women and girls and has acted as a champion for policy change in education, community, and economic development. She just stepped off a plane from India, so please help me welcome President Rihanna Zwart. Hi everyone. I'm very honored to be here and to represent, as Dr. Murasi said, the strongest commission in the country. I'm joined tonight by our Vice President, Dr. Miri, Commissioners Debbie Meslow. Can we give it up for our commissioners? <laughs> Carrie Schwab Pomerantz, Andrea Shorter, and Ms. Julie Sue. And the reason why this commission and this department is so important because every day we live the theme of this month, which is building pathways to safety. According to the National Coalition Against Domestic Violence, an average of 20 Americans experience domestic violence every minute. That's 10 million victims in a single year in the US. And according to the coalition, domestic violence survivors lose 8 million working days per year at the cost of $8.3 billion a year. So the numbers are there and they're scary, but we can't get lost in the numbers because we have to remember the faces and the humanity of what happens when people are victims and survivors of domestic violence. And what I'm proud of today with this commission is that we have provided an unprecedented $8.6 million in funding to community-based organizations working across the city to support victims and survivors of violence and their families with crisis lines, counseling, case management, legal services, emergency and transitional shelter. Can I give it up for $8.6 million in services for this city and county? So for example, we provide substantial funding to three domestic violence shelters, including the first in the nation, the Asian Women's 
shelter, the first in California, La Casa de las Madres, and St. Vincent de Paul Society. Through these grants, we are serving thousands of victims and survivors. In 2017, our partners fielded over 25,000 service calls, provided 20,000 hours of counseling and legal support, and reached 12,000 individuals in violence education and prevention programs. Our strong network of partners and providers services in dozens of languages and works to ensure that their work with the survivors is done in a culturally competent and sensitive way. Again, we always look past the numbers and the humanity, the people that face us every day to make sure that we are providing the needs of this community. So make some noise again for our partner agencies who are doing this work every day. We are so proud of you. And even with all of that, the demand is greater than the supply. For every one person served in our emergency shelters, we are about four people who are turned away every day and placed outside of San Francisco. We have to do better. There is more work to be done to ensure that survivors and their families are on a path towards safety. Every day, survivors are faced with the impossible choice of between remaining in an abusive environment that are potentially life-threatening or leaving and becoming homeless. With the strong leadership of Mayor Breed, we must work together to invest in expanded services and more shelter spaces for domestic violence and their families. By providing safe places for survivors and supporting them to rebuild their lives, we can break the cycle of violence. Do I, is our guest of honor here? Okay, fantastic. So, with that, I want to introduce someone who I'm honored to work with our supervisor, Catherine Stephanie, who I know is not afraid to stand up and defend survivors and whose leadership in this city and county is unprecedented when it comes to finding pathways for safety. Give it up for Supervisor Stephanie. Thank you, Brianna, so much. And I want to thank the Department on the Status of Women and the Domestic Violence Consortium for sponsoring today's event and for everybody who came out here today to show your support. It is truly an honor to join many of our community partners as we continue to fight against domestic violence. I look forward to the day when we don't have to do this. We've made great progress in this city, but we know we have a lot more work to do. According to a recent United Nations report, the most dangerous place for a woman around the world is in her home. More than half of all women homicide victims in recent years were killed by their partners or relatives. And while we know that it is not just women who are affected by domestic violence, women are far more likely than men to experience violence in the home. And in the United States, more than one in three women will report experiencing abuse by a domestic partner in their lifetimes. This abuse impacts not only the victims, but entire families and communities. When domestic abusers have access to guns, the effects are deadly. We know that over half of female victims who are killed by their partners in the United States are killed with guns. And if you're a woman in the United States, you are 16 times more likely to die by gun violence by an intimate partner than in other countries. And we also know that most mass shootings in the United States, over 50% of them are related to domestic violence. Listen to this statistic, this one blew me away. 92% of all women killed with guns in high income countries in 2015 were from the United States. 92% is absolutely unacceptable. We know that in so many cases, law enforcement and families feel powerless to stop tragedies. We have been hamstrung in getting weapons out of the hands of those who would harm their partners and family members. And there is no single way to win the fight against domestic violence. But we will not win unless we continue to bring attention to this important issue and pass legislation at every single level of government. That is why this month I will introduce my ordinance finally to implement the gun violence restraining order law in San Francisco and I'm very happy to be doing that with the help of Deputy Chief Lazar. Gun violence restraining order laws give families and law enforcement the power to temporarily remove an individual's access to firearms before they commit acts of violence. It's also known as red flag laws. Gun violence restraining orders save lives. 
I look forward to passing this legislation at the Board of Supervisors and continuing to work for common sense legislation to protect those affected by domestic violence. It is really so inspiring to be here surrounded by our city's leaders and advocates who are all working, we're all on the same page to end domestic violence in San Francisco. And I look forward to continue, continuing that work with you all. Thank you. Thank you so much, Supervisor Stephanie. A couple other folks to recognize. Representing the Sheriff's Office, we have Deputy Kathy Johnson. Give us a wave. I'm going to invite back to the podium uh, President Brianna Zwart to uh, introduce our very special guest tonight. All right, I'm back. And I'm really honored again to be back to introduce one of my personal heroes the mayor of San Francisco, London Breed, who is a committed and compassionate women's rights advocate, who we know is not afraid to stand up to defend survivors and under whose leadership the city has been working to further prevent. And I think that that is key here. We can't erase, there's no silver bullet, but this mayor is committed to preventing this every single day. And without further ado, uh, ado Mayor Breed. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. I want to thank each and every one of you for being here to recognize uh, something that is so critical uh, to what we need to do in terms of the work of the city and county of San Francisco, and that is honoring and, and remembering survivors of domestic violence and making sure that their, their memories are not forgotten, that we do not forget who they are and some of the challenges that they experienced. Uh, in fact, we know all too well the history of our city and our country. In fact, the neighborhood that I grew up in, it was not uncommon to sadly see men beat up their girlfriends and their wives. And when the police would get called on occasion, and I've had this experience directly, they would come and sadly, in some cases, people would pretend as if nothing ever happened and no one would be held accountable for that because the fact is so many of those women were living in fear, in fear of what might happen if they did stand up. And the kinds of situations that they were in requires us to make sure that we are doing more to protect people, to make sure that no matter what relationship you're in, that you shouldn't have to fear your partner, your spouse, or fear that you don't have support or resources available to you to help in case you are in a situation like that. And we are here today to remember that there's still work to be done. And in fact, here in San Francisco, although we've invested millions of dollars, over $8.5 million into programs and services and resources that help those who tragically are victims of domestic violence that help with crisis hotlines, that help with shelter and, and other access to services, we know that there's still work to be done and we are committed to the work. We also know that sadly in the Bayview Hunters Point community, we are seeing record numbers of domestic violence incidents that have been reported. And as a result, we have to be focused on new ways in which we can make it easier to help people who are in need of help. We in the San Francisco Police Department have launched a new opportunity for an app that uh, is called Heart. It's, it's, it's an application that using technology that assists police officers right on the spot with identifying you know, what is happening in the situation and asking the right questions, and more importantly, how we directly connect people who are victims with services right away. It is the first step in so many other things that we know we can do as a city to be innovative, to be creative around creating opportunities uh, to connect people to resources, knowing that as tough as someone may be, it can happen to anyone at any given time in any relationship. And so it's important that we continue to provide the support, to provide the resources, to remember the tragedies that have occurred, 
to never forget those who especially have lost their lives and to really commend and thank the survivors who have come forward to tell their story and to be advocates for change around this most critical issue. Today and tonight, in fact, we light up City Hall in the color purple, the purple that the color that recognizes Domestic Violence Awareness Month in San Francisco. And when we see San Francisco lit up this color today, we think about the people, the experiences, the stories, the challenges that have existed. But more importantly, we think about the resilience of such an incredible community of people who have stepped up, told their story, and really have been able to make change happen. The difference between what happened in the past when I was growing up and what happens now, when there's an issue of domestic violence and the police come, someone's gonna be held accountable. It took a long time to get to that point, but we are in a better place with more work that needs to be done. And I know with the Commission on the Status of Women, with the San Francisco Police Department, with so many incredible nonprofit organizations that continue to work on so many of these issues every single day, that it's only a matter of time before we finally get to a better place where we don't lose a life over domestic violence in this city and in this country. Thank you all so much for coming out today and for your advocacy and work and support on this very critical issue in our city. Thank you so much. Another round of applause for the leadership of Mayor London Breed. We're so excited about this new announcement that will really bring more uh, victim survivor services. So uh, we're really excited about that. Uh, our next speaker is Beverly Upton. Executive Director of the Domestic Violence Consortium, which brings together an incredible network of organizations to support survivors of domestic violence and their families. Uh, Beverly was a key partner in putting together tonight's event. Please join me in giving her a warm welcome. Thank you, Emily. Thank you so much. I'm so honored to stand here with, uh, with Emily again this year. We've lighted City Hall purple for about a decade, and we've seen a lot of progress in that decade. Um, we've been gathering here to show the city's commitment to ending domestic violence, violence against women, and violence towards San Francisco's most vulnerable residents. We gather here today to honor those who certainly have survived and um, are here with us. They are our heroes. But this is also a time that we get to gather and honor the folks that are answering the crisis lines 24 hours a day, that are running the shelters, La Casa, Asian Women's Shelter, the Riley Center, 24-7, 365 days a year, <laughs> keeping survivors and their children safe. Lots of children in shelter. I'm sure you'll hear more. They are teaching, training, working with survivors, working with youth. We have APILO youth here today. Um, they are taking the tough cases. They're getting the restraining orders. They're taking these complex cases that are so confusing and there's so many details and the abuse has gone on for so long. It takes a good legal community to unravel those cases, support the survivors and take them where they need to go. We have that. I see Gerald here, I see Emberly here, I see our attorneys from the Justice and Diversity Center. We want to honor you for being in the trenches and really coming through for survivors and their kids. This is what we're here for today. This is what the mayor is supporting. This is what the department and the Commission on the Status of Women are supporting. This team of survivors here now, 24 hours a day. But we wouldn't be here without our city partners. Emily Marase and her team at the Department on the Status of Women are such great leaders. They support 
24 hours a day, these agencies. They um, help us make sure that our stats are right and help us tell the story. They help us connect with City Hall every day. They help us connect with the Commission on the Status of Women. None of us would be here without our city partners. We wouldn't be here without the mayor's office. We wouldn't be here without Mayor Breed. And we wouldn't be here without the Board of Supervisors. The Board of Supervisors works with us every year to try to make sure that we have the resources we need to meet new communities where they are, to support our immigrant brothers and sisters, our transgender brother and sisters, our Native American brothers and sisters. Yes, yes, absolutely. We, as Mayor Breed said, we have a lot to do, we have more to do, and we're gonna need more resources, but I know that they will be there when we need them. They are really our heroes, and you are really our heroes. When we look at our Native sisters working to end domestic violence, when we look at our transgender community working to end domestic violence in their community, yes, we're so happy to see you and we're so happy to stand with you always. Survivors and their children are our heroes. They, are, they take the courage every year. They are beyond heroic every day to step out of violent situations and risk, as President Zwart said, becoming homeless or worse or worse. They risk it because of this safety net here. We have to get rid of gun violence. We have to protect our citizens. We have to protect our residents, our most vulnerable people in San Francisco. And we can do it. I think Supervisor Stephanie really gave us a good path to look down this year. Let's get these, this legislative uh, work going. Let's work with the police department. Let's get guns out of the hands of abusers and stalkers. Yeah. It's pretty simple. Don't let anybody make it complex for you. It's not out of the hands of abusers and stalkers. So, their lives and the lives of children count, and we are all here to do everything we can to end domestic violence in every community, to make San Francisco the safest city in the nation. Can we do more? Yes. Must we do more? Yes. And we will. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Beverly. Uh, under Mayor London Breed, uh, she has made a historic investment in these services, the largest budget ever for services uh, to victims and their families of uh, domestic violence, sexual assault, and human trafficking. So we're really blessed to be in the city that's making this huge investment. I want to recognize a few more people. Uh, Nicole Lindler from the Mayor's Office helped make today happen. Uh, Kelly Lou Densmore has joined us from the Human Rights Commission and the SHARP office. Uh, Tammy Bryant from the San Francisco County Democratic Central Committee. We need our political leadership here as well. And we have our friends from San Mateo County, our domestic violence advocates from our neighboring county who are here. So as I mentioned, the theme of tonight's event is building pathways to safety. Domestic violence is often the cause of homelessness, especially for our LGBTQ community and families with children. Our partner agencies play a vital role in providing services to survivors of violence, and we're fortunate to have a diverse set of services to reach our diverse populations. Just a reminder that we will be lighting City Hall purple, and concluding tonight will be the Red Women's Lightning Group. Yeah, yeah let's hear it for Red Women's Lightning Group. So tonight, we want to recognize the commitment and hard work of our partners who provide emergency shelter. Our next three speakers represent organizations that do this every day. Please join me in welcoming Orchid Pusey, Executive Director of Asian Women's Shelter, the first shelter for Asian Americans in the country. Good evening. My name's Orchid. I've got orchid-colored glasses, and I'm ready for this year's Domestic Violence Awareness Month press conference here with all of you. I am here with Asian Women's Shelter and with every person, every person here who believes that ending domestic violence is key to building healthy, safe, and hopeful communities. So this year, 
2019, it actually marks the 30th anniversary of the first time that the US Congress passed legislation to designate October as National Domestic Violence Awareness Month. And when they passed that legislation for the first time in 1989, it was actually eight years after the National Coalition Against Domestic Violence had grown an initial day of unity in 1981 into a week and then a month of events. And these events were designed to do three things that we're still doing today. One, to mourn those and to honor those who have been killed by people perpetrating domestic violence. Two, to celebrate and to support those who have survived and are still surviving today. And three, to connect those who work to end violence so that we can lean on each other, uplift each other, and amplify our longevity and our impact beyond what any of us could do if we were in isolation from each other. So 30 years later, we have come a long way and clearly we're not going anywhere because our job is not done yet. We have so many to honor and mourn here in our city as well as across our state, nation and world. Whether they were killed by their perpetrators, framed by them, had their mysterious deaths covered up by them, or were driven to suicide or self-harm, by the people who made their life unlivable. We also, 30 years later, we have so many to support and to celebrate as they rebuild their lives from rock bottom after having given up everything to try to carve out a new future for themselves and for their children and because violence travels intergenerationally for their children's children. These survivors are champions who are trying to reroute this intergenerational violence and carve out a new lifeline for their family amidst odds that I think would make most of us, at least me, not be able to get up in the morning. And 30 years later, we have so many more of us who are working to end violence and who have been gifted the progress that's been made by those who came before us. But still, we have to be here and we have to be really loud, we have to be really clear, we have to be really confident and sure about what we're doing, and we are. There are still people and forces out there who are perpetuating myths about domestic violence and who need our help to become more aware. They still think domestic violence isn't actually that big of a deal, that it's a contained issue, that it's special interest or it's private or it's personal, it's about anger or it's about alcoholism and that there's nothing we can do because it's about individual people. And individual people are who they are. Some people are just inherently more violent and others are inherently more submissive. And we're here every single month, and especially in October, to take those myths and grind them to a pulp and flush them because we know they're not true. We're here 30 years later using this platform to say domestic violence, it is personal, it is private, and it's social. It's political. And we are showing that this is an issue that we pay a tremendous price, an unacceptable price for allowing to continue. At Asian Women's Shelter here in San Francisco, we know that domestic violence is interwoven into every single issue that we're arguing about in this country right now. Immigration, yep. Gun violence, gun control, yep. Homelessness, yep. Workforce development, poverty, gender justice, policing and incarceration, equal pay, all of it. And now 30 years later we have more data and others have mentioned some of these pieces that on average 20 to 24 people per minute, that means we're approaching 100 since I've been talking, are victims of rape, physical violence or stalking by an intimate partner in the United States, which is 10 to 12 million people over the course of a year. That is completely unacceptable. In a 16-year study ending in 2010, while we know that domestic violence victimizes people across the gender spectrum, that study showed four in five victims of intimate partner violence were female identified. And when we look at the numbers, the risk factors for women living with disabilities, for survivors who are indigenous, survivors who are black, survivors who are transgender, who are undocumented, who speak limited English. We know that the pathways that we have to create, they don't look the same way. 
we have to have all different kinds of pathways that address the different barriers and challenges that different survivors face in our communities, in our neighborhoods, in our schools, and in our families. We also have to recognize, as has also been said before, the kids. The kids. Nationally, the majority of people who abuse their intimate partner do so in front of the kids. And 50% also abuse their children. But over and over, week after week, in our counties here in the Bay Area, we see decisions made that don't reflect knowledge of this, that somehow think that you can terrorize your intimate partner but be an amazing parent. That is not true. In 2018, Every Town for Gun Safety report indicated that at least 54% of mass shootings in the United States revealed that the perpetrator also shot a current or former intimate partner or family member. Over 54%, and that almost 100% of those perpetrators of mass violence had histories of violence or verbalized violence and hatred against women. We can't say that they're unconnected anymore. We can't say domestic violence is private and personal anymore, that it's only personal and not connected to public health and public safety. So what I want people to know this Domestic Violence Awareness Month, and I want people to still know it, know it even better in November, and even better in December, and be able to tell all the people you know about it, but not so much that they don't invite you to your parties anymore, <laughs> that violent armed perpetrators of domestic violence are a deadly force in America and also here in our city in San Francisco. And ending domestic violence is central to saving lives, to saving childhoods, to saving our public health and our workplace safety and our school safety and ultimately our future. So to all the partners here, whether you're in government, whether you're a nonprofit, if you work at night, if you answer the crisis line, if you're an advocate with infants or you're an advocate with adults or seniors, I want to tell you thank you so much for your creativity and your stamina. And you're not alone. None of us is alone. And to the survivors out there, I want to tell you that when you feel that you're most alone, somehow in a tiny place in your mind and heart, believe that you're not. That we are out there. We're scattered all across the city and we're scattered all across the Bay Area. And we speak your language. We grew up in a family like yours. We grew up in a neighborhood like yours. And we cannot wait to support you to find all of your strength and decide what you want to do to have a better life. And you can call us. You don't have to know what you want to do. Most of us have no idea what we want to do with our life. You don't have to know either. But you can call, and we can talk about it. And we won't judge you, and we won't gossip about you, and we care. It's our whole life. This is what we care about the most. And to the kids out there, to the kids that are being woken up several nights a week in fear, to the kids that wake up and spend their nighttime comforting their younger siblings so that they won't make anything worse, to the kids that then have to get up and go to school and they can't focus and their grades aren't good and they're making disruptions and having marks of negative attached to them. I want to tell those kids too, I want you to know, we can't freaking wait to work with you. We want to help you with your homework. We want to help you rebuild your relationship with your nonviolent parent. We want you to have a safe place at night and to sleep with stuffies and have hope for your future because we have hope for your future and we're going nowhere until this issue is gone. Thank you. Another round of applause for Orchid PC. There are a few more uh, city department heads that have joined me in addition to Fire Chief Janine Nicholson, uh, Linda Jarul, Department of Technology. We could not have done our smartphone app without her and her staff. Please recognize Linda Jarul. Also, Joaquin Torres has joined us, uh, Director of the Office of Economic and Workforce Development. Thank you for joining us, Joaquin. Our next speaker is Kathy Black, Executive Director of La Casa de las Madres, the first domestic violence shelter in California. Please give her a warm welcome. Thank you, thank you. Um, Orchid, you're awesome. <laughs> I just want to say that. 
Um, so in keeping with today's theme, Building Pathways to Safety, I want you to know, I'm going to take it a little more local, and I want you to know that at La Casa, we respond to calls for help from victims of domestic violence of all ages, 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. We give survivors the tools to transform their lives. We seek to prevent future violence by educating the community and redefining public perceptions about domestic violence. We attempt to accomplish this by engaging nearly 20,000 women, teens, men, older adults, and children each year through a continuum of expert intervention and prevention services. We, we, we also envision a community where domestic violence is not tolerated and equal as access to asset building opportunities is freely available to all. I, I, um, I want to talk about a local stat, um, a, stat a La Casa stat, and that is of the 7,000 um, hotline calls we take every year, or this last year, I should say, 500 of those were from the San Francisco Police Department law enforcement and from the medical community. So we are working really hard to engage um, community partners who are out, um, first responders, and, and to make a difference in that way. Uh, and I feel like that ties to the mayor's press release today because um, we believe that these early interventions are really key to future safety. That by connecting victims um, and survivors with community resources like the ones represented here and all out there, I see my crew out there, um, that that helps reduce the incident of future violence. And some other uh, highlights from this past year, just so you get an idea about the scope of the work that some of our programs provide, um, we provided 10,991 nights of uh, shelter to 368 women and their children. And 87% of the mothers who stayed in our shelter participate in family counseling and support groups. People are, are, are eager to learn and eager to get resources. We often operate at or over capacity. Last year, it was 22% of the year we operated either at our full capacity or over. What that means is that in the middle of the night when the police department calls, we bring out, a, uh, and we're full, which we are a lot, we have, um, rollaway beds, we have couches, we figure things out, and we will shelter uh, victims and survivors overnight while they're figuring out what their next move might be with our, uh, of course, with the expert help of the staff and our community partners. It's also, I think, I, I want you to know that, uh, again, whether it's 10 p.m. or 2 a.m., when when a law enforcement, when a first responder is going through this um, uh, lethality assessment tool, that when they connect that victim with an advocate at La Casa and the, they decide to do an intake, that victim is going to meet the same advocate at the door of our shelter. So that it's not, it's, there's compassion, there's consistency, and I think that makes a big difference for people. It's a real personal connection. Over 92% of clients, of our clients report, and I'm sure this is true of my partner programs as well, over 92% of clients report positive outcomes across our five key metrics, which is, um, I have to look and see what it is, knowledge, safety, stability, agency, and isolation. And, um, you know, uh, with that, I want to really um, say that we're one agency as part of a larger safety net. And I, I, I see my friends surrounded, or I'm surrounded here by friends and allies, and we couldn't do the work without city partnerships, um, political allies, um, people like Joaquin, who's been a friend for years, thank you, Joaquin, for everything that you do for us, and, and the community partners that we work with. So thank you very much.
Our third and final representative of our domestic violence emergency shelter community is Shari Wooldridge, Executive Director of the Riley Center, St. Vincent de Paul Society. Please give her a warm welcome. Good evening. If we are to address and prevent domestic violence holistically, we must provide comprehensive, supportive services centered on the, the survivor's trauma and need while highlighting their individual, family, and community systems, strengths, and protective factors. If we, and if we focus our efforts in providing client-centered, trauma-informed, and culturally incentive supportive services, we will support the long-term healing of inter intergenerational cycle of violence experienced by survivors and their children. This will lead to a stronger, safer, and healthier family and community systems free of violence. This is what we work on at St. Vincent de Paul O'Reilly Center. We have four major programs in which we do this. We have a Brennan House, which is our transitional housing program. We have Rosalie House, which is our emergency shelter and our crisis line. We have our community office where, where survivors can get the services they need, education, workshops, support groups. And then we also work with the family services department. And so if there's an incidence of domestic violence, we have a specialist that help that family move to a healthier life. We've been in the city of San Francisco for 35 years, and we are very proud of the work that we do. Well, I want to take this time to thank um, our DV Consortium, Beverly, our domestic, our de Department of Status of Women, and the staff and all our community partners of the work that we do. This is how we survive the domestic violence system in the, in the city. Thank you. Thank you so much, Shari. Uh, as President Zawart stated, prevention is an, a critical part of our work to stop the cycle of violence. For over 20 years, Asian Pacific Islander Legal Outreach has engaged youth through its Youth Advisory Council to address gender-based and dating violence in Asian and Pacific Islander communities. Please join me in welcoming the Youth Advisory Council and Sao Xu, the Youth Coordinator for APILO. Give him a warm welcome. Good evening, everyone. We are the Youth Advisory Council from API Legal Outreach. At the Youth Advisory Council, we strive for an accepting and equitable future in which everyone is healthily loved. As, as youth in our communities, it is important we engage in work against domestic violence to educate our peers and prevent its occurrence in our everyday lives. Through this work, we believe in setting pathways to safety. The Youth Advisory Council meets to share a safe and brave space where we are able to become activists and create positive change in our communities. In honor of Domestic Violence Awareness Month, every year, the Youth Advisory Council sets up presentations about teen dating violence to youth organizations, schools, and community spaces all over the Bay Area. We not only inform our peers and give them a better understanding of healthy and unhealthy relationships, but we also empower, the, empower other youth and equip them with the skills and knowledge to make change in their communities. As youth ourselves, we are able to directly connect with other youth and encourage them to be active and involved in their community. We believe in encouraging our young male identifying peers to break the culture of silence regarding violence within our communities. We also seek to empower youth from the LGBT plus community, people of color and women. There are patriarchal and systematic effects that are prevalent in our underserved communities, specifically low-income people of color. There are societal norms that places men in positions of power over women. In my experience as a young woman of color, I've seen the cultural and societal expectations of gender roles placed upon women of color that make it difficult for women of color to tell their truth. These marginalized women are survivors and deserve justice, but this justice system abuses their power to oppress this community. We believe that in order to be healthily loved, education is crucial. It is important to be able to identify an unhealthy relationship. For starters, in any relationship, 
It is important that both partners know what consent really is. Consent is a strong and continuous yes. It is also a decision that cannot be influenced by substances or power imbalances. Another vital factor in safety and determining unhealthy relationships is the cycle of violence. A cycle of which the abuser or abusers trap the survivor in an unhealthy relationship. Through the Youth Advisory Council's presentations, we also stress the importance of a pragmatic yet optimistic mindset. Everyone should feel safe opening up to others, but we should still take the necessary precautions to ensure our safety and well-being. It is also crucial to be well informed of the reality of domestic violence, including some causes and societal factors that perpetuate this issue. This mindset combines both positivity and practicality, which can help to avoid violence and or aggression. YAC is important amongst San Francisco teens because we present students with accurate information about domestic violence and the resources they can use to confront these situations. Often teens take to social media to speak about issues, but only to the extent, extent of republishing a post. They don't necessarily check their sources and this leads to people being misinformed and quickly disinterested. YAC is helpful in this way because it gives straightforward and reliable information on domestic abuse and dating violence, as well as resources for people in these situations. This is especially needed in metropolitan areas such as San Francisco, where there isn't a strong sense of community or people to watch out for one another. Too often, youth are unaware of the resources that they have at hand if they find themselves in an unhealthy relationship. These resources include hotlines, restraining orders, and measures of self-defense. Through our presentations, YAC works to bring attention to these issues which are often not touched upon in schools. Our work as youth is equally, if not more important, as the work of previous generations. Our actions will lead to pathways to safety for our youth, not only now, but as they grow into adulthood in the future. So we urge you all to listen to the youth around you. Encourage them to become involved in our communities. Provide them the support that they need to make profound changes in our society. But most importantly, give them the resources to protect themselves and find pathways to safety in their environments. Thank you. Another round of applause for our Youth Advisory Council. So our final speaker tonight, uh, before our concluding performance and group photo, please be sure to stay for the group photo, uh, our final speaker is April McGill, a California native and director of community partnerships and projects for the California Consortium of Urban Indian Health. April will share about the incredibly important project called Red Women Rising, which advocates for culturally responsive services for urban Indian survivors. Please give a warm welcome to April. Oh, yawi. My name is April McGill. I'm an enrolled member of Round Valley Indian Tribes, California native. San Francisco resident, and I first and foremost want to recognize our ancestors, the Ohlone people whose land we reside on today. I just want to remind everybody that we stand on stolen land. This land was stolen by violence, so we have a history of violence in all of our lives, in every single one of you. You've experienced that energy and that violence from this land. At Sakui, our Red Woman Rising project brings attention to domestic violence and missing and murdered indigenous women here in California. We work with all the urban Indian health and tribal consortiums here to bring more attention to violence against native women. As California Indian women, we've uh, experienced this violence since the gold rush. We know this violence. This has been happening throughout Indian country, throughout many nations. But our work is to make change at Sakui 
with our Red Woman Rising project by bringing attention to policy and legislative initiatives that can change and impact issues around domestic violence and missing and murdered indigenous women in California. We work with uh, many legislators to make change. We work with SBI from Sovereign Bodies Institute. We work with Strong Heart Native Women's Coalition and we partner with all of our other grassroots organizations here in San Francisco that are also standing behind me. I wanted to share with you some statistics from the Strong, uh, but from Sovereign Bodies Institute about California. Statewide, there's 135 missing and murdered indigenous women and girls cases across California that have been identified. California is number five for total number of missing and indigenous women and girl cases alongside Washington, New Mexico, Arizona, and Montana. 75% of all cases in California occurred in Northern California. Nearly one third, 28% of all cases in the state of Humboldt and Del Norte County or involved in victims enrolled in tribes in Humboldt and Del Norte counties. Of the 135 cases, only seven have information on alleged perpetrators available to the public and only one of those alleged perpetrators has actually been charged. Over half the cases documented in California uh, occurred in the last three years. From 2013 through 2015, the rate of MMIWG cases per year statewide increased by approximately 20% each year. In 2016, the rate of cases increased, and in 2018, the rate increased as well. San Francisco is one of the highest uh, MMIWGs in the state, which is really embarrassing considering that we have such a progressive state. One of the things that um, I can say is that we are making change with support from the mayor. Um, thank you, London Breed, for all your support for the American Indian community. Thank you, um, Supervisor Ronan and Supervisor Brown, because we were able to pass a resolution in May, recognizing May 5th as the National Day of Awareness honoring missing and murdered indigenous women. I would like to read the resolution. Whereas indigenous people have inhabited the North American continent, including the state of California for many centuries, and from the first contact with settlers, settlers from other countries, Native Americans share their knowledge of the land and its resources, and have continued to play a vital role in the development of local communities, the state of California, and the nation. Whereas the missing and murdered indigenous women and girls report from the Urban Indian Health Institute released in 2009 by SBI provides data from 71 urban cities across the United States on missing and murdered indigenous women and girls, recognizing that a number of factors, including poor data collection by law enforcement and limited health resources, that there is an undercount of MMIW in urban areas such as San Francisco, and we're ranked 10th among cities with the highest number of MMIW cases whereas the 2009 Apology to Native American People of the U.S. recognized the special legal and political relationship Indian tribes have with the United States and the solemn convenient with the land we share. Recognize that there has been years of official oh, sorry, policies and the breaking of, of laws by federal government regarding Indian tribes. Apologized on behalf of the people of the United States to all Native peoples for the many instances of violence, maltreatment and neglect inflicted on native people by citizens of the United States and commend that the state governments that have begun reconciliation efforts with Native American tribes located in the boundaries encourage all state governments to work toward uh, reconciling relationships with Indian tribes within their boundaries whereas the city and county of San Francisco has a responsibility to address the disappropriational rates of victimization of indigenous women from domestic and sexual violence, including missing and murdered indigenous women. And whereas our sister, Jessica Nicole Alva, Blackfeet Aztec Yaqui died on April 6, 2019, at the age of 35 after being in a coma for four days as a result of an abusive domestic relationship. Jessica grew up in Reading and lived in San Francisco for five years. She is survived by her mother, Cindy, Martin Wolf and her six children and four siblings with a stepbrother and stepsister. And whereas in 2005, 
grassroots movement for the safety of indigenous women led the struggle to include safety for Indian women under the Violence Against Women Act. Whereas over the last decade, awareness of the national issue has increased, but more must be done at all levels to stop the disappearance and save lives of our women. Whereas May 5th, 2017 was designated as the first National Day of Awareness for honoring missing and murdered indigenous women through the efforts of survival families, Native American tribes, national indigenous organizations, and law and policymakers. Now resolved, the city and county of San Francisco permanently designates May 5th as honoring missing and murdered indigenous women, Women's Day in the city and county of San Francisco, and furthermore, will begin discussions with urban Indian organizations, neighboring Native American tribes, local tribal organizations to develop recommendations for local and indigenous victim advocacy services, local and tribal justice responses, including coordination and identify the implement solutions to strengthen the safety and health well-being of our indigenous women. Thank you, San Francisco Mayor's Office for this resolution. I I now would like to ask my sister Aurora to come up and introduce our Red Lightning Women Singers. Oh. oh. Good evening, relatives. Uh, we are from the Red Lightning Women Power uh, group. We uh, came about the name through um, our sister Betty Trujillo over here in regards to Missy Murdered Indigenous, Indigenous Women. We started about a year and a half, two years ago through a red ribbon dress uh, workshop where we had some workshops on domestic violence and sexual assault awareness. Um, we created and sewed 21 ribbon skirts. Uh, red represents uh, our missing, murdered indigenous women and domestic violence. Uh, we are from the Native American Health Center here in San Francisco, the wellness department located down on Mission and 7th. Uh, let's see, I just wanted to here. We believe that women are sacred, and when we wear our skirts, we're sacred. And also, uh, Native women, as April mentioned, have the highest rate of domestic violence. Um, we believe in saying her name uh, for our sisters that are no longer here due to domestic violence. Um, and we come from matriarchal society originally, before colonizers came. And um, I just want to say, remat rematriate. We're going to sing a Missy Murder Indigenous Women's song this evening. Thank you.
we close. First, uh, Nicole Lindler, the senior advisor to the mayor for helping us put together today. Nicole, give us a wave. Secondly, Beverly Upton of the Domestic Violence Consortium. Where's Beverly? And finally, I want to really thank Elise Hansel of the Department on the Status of Women. Please wave. She helped put all of today's logistics together. I want to thank all of my staff at the department. Please join us here for a very large group photo, which you want to do really quickly. So everybody, come on up, come on up. Uh, grab your banner and pose for our picture. Thank you so much.